PCIe bandwidth is one of those specs that gets thrown around a lot when talking about new motherboards and graphics cards. But today we're going to take a look at whether different PCIe generations actually make a meaningful difference in gaming performance. We've tested PCIe 3.0, 4.0 and 5.0 at x16 bandwidth across multiple games and resolutions to see if the extra bandwidth of newer generations translates to real world performance gains. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Doc, you gotta help me. I, I can't land a single shot. 1080p, 30 hertz. Andy, I'm afraid you're suffering from a severe case of suboptimal hardware. What? What you need is the Philips Evnia 27M2N8500. 1440p, 360 hertz, display HDR true black 400, lightning fast 0.03 millisecond response time, and a true 10-bit QD OLED display. You'll be popping headshots in no time. It's, it's beautiful. Oh, let's see how I do. This might be terminal. Next level gaming with Philips Evnia, skill not included. Find out more by clicking the link in the description below. All right, so let's jump straight into what we've tested here. We've taken a comprehensive approach by benchmarking PCIe 3.0, 4.0, and 5.0, all at X16 lane configurations across 1080p, 1440p, and 4K resolutions using an RTX 5090. The CPU we used was a Ryzen 7 9800X3D, and for the operating system, we use Windows 11 24H2 for all of these benchmarks. For our testing, we used a variety of modern titles with different game engine types and rendering techniques, from ray trace AAA games to more CPU-bound competitive titles. All games were tested at the highest or near highest settings to put maximum stress on the system, namely on that RTX 5090. Now what's particularly interesting is that while PCIe bandwidth differences are often discussed in the context of graphics card performance, the real world impact can well, vary dramatically depending on the game engine, resolution and whether you're CPU or GPU bound. So rather than just telling you the average performance difference, we're going to break this down game by game and by resolution to give you the full picture. So starting at 1080p, this is where we typically expect to see the biggest differences between PCIe generations. Lower resolutions tend to be more CPU bound, which means data is being passed back and forth between the CPU and GPU more frequently, potentially making PCIe bandwidth more relevant. As we take a look at the data, one of the standout examples of this is F124, where we saw a significant jump in performance when moving from PCIe 3 to 5.0. At ultra high with TAA settings for 1080p, PCIe 5.0 delivered 294 FPS average compared to 267 FPS on PCIe 3.0. That's a 10% improvement, which is quite substantial overall. The 1% low showed an even more dramatic improvement, jumping from 147 to 168 FPS, which is about a 14% gain. And this suggests that in highly optimized racing simulators with consistent frame pacing requirements, that the PCIe bandwidth can indeed be a limiting factor. Baldur's Gate 3 with DX11 showed possibly the most dramatic scaling at 1080p in those all important lows, with PCIe 5.0 delivering 208 FPS versus just 156 on PCIe 3.0. That's a massive 33% improvement in the 1% lows. And, well, that's the kind of difference you'd actually feel in gameplay, as with that kind of increase, it would feel like an entirely different GPU altogether. Average FPS-wise on Baldur's Gate 3, we do see a more modest gain from 295 FPS to 326, so nowhere near the kind of scaling that we saw for the minimum frame rates, but it's an improvement nonetheless. And as we move through the resolutions, things align more between the different bandwidth settings. Now, not all games show dramatic differences. For instance, in War Thunder at maximum settings, despite being a relatively well-optimized title, we saw almost no to little gains with 534 FPS on PCIe 5.0 compared to just 523 on PCIe 3.0 in those 1% lows. So only really about a 2% improvement. That's virtually negligible, even for competitive players. An average frame rate scaling from 645 to 663, again, there just really isn't much in it. Now, one thing to note here is that we're even constrained at 1440p, which is unusual because you'd expect it to be the opposite, but the results are virtually the same. 
523 to 533 from PCIe 3 to PCIe 5 in the all-important lows. And then average frame rates being, well, virtually identical. This suggests a CPU limitation is at play, which is what we'd actually expect for something like War Thunder, but it's interesting to see nonetheless. Black Myth Wukong at higher with ray tracing set to medium was an interesting case, with the lows giving us 107 FPS on PCIe 5.0 versus 91 FPS on PCIe 3.0, which is a more substantial 18% improvement, though not as dramatic as some of the other titles like Baldur's Gate that we showed previously. The average frame rate doesn't see as big of an improvement, moving from 118 FPS to 123, which equals just a 4% gain. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 at 1080p shows extreme differences between generations. At PCIe 3.0 speeds, the average results in just 102 FPS, and then 127 FPS on PCIe 4.0, and on PCIe 5.0, the average jumps to 150, which is a massive 47% difference in frame rate between Gen 3 and Gen 5. This game in particular is one of the interesting cases where it has constant streaming with direct storage, which would explain this massive outlier, but it's definitely an extreme outlier in terms of how much FPS can I gain from simply upgrading my motherboard compared to the rest of the games listed. It's worth noting that games with ray tracing enabled generally show mixed scaling across PCIe generations at 1080p. The increased complexity of the rendering pipeline doesn't necessarily translate to more PCIe bandwidth dependency, at least not consistently across all titles. Of course, this will vary heavily by game, some will be constrained by the CPU and others by pure GPU grunt. Now, as we move up to 1440p, we typically expect to see less PCIe scaling as the workload shifts more towards being GPU bound. And indeed, the data generally confirms this trend. In F124 at ultra high TAA, the difference between PCIe 3 and 5 narrows to just 9%, with 142 FPS on PCIe 5 versus 124 FPS on Gen 3 for the all important 1% lows. Still a noticeable improvement, but not as dramatic as what we saw at 1080p. And the average frame rate is, well, more or less sandbagged once we scale past Gen 4, scaling from 229 FPS in the averages to 239 on Gen 5. So roughly a 4% gain, but definitely hitting a wall at 238 FPS for PCIe Gen 4, which, well, suggests we're more or less GPU bound, and as such have diminishing return scaling, the PCIe generation past Gen 4 in this case. Interestingly, some games still maintain significant scaling even at 1440p. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, for instance, on very high settings with ray tracing set to the very high setting, shows Gen 5 delivering 110 FPS versus 109 on Gen 3. So virtually no improvement at all in those 1% lows. However, the averages tell a well, very different story, jumping from 151 FPS to 178, which is an 18% improvement that would definitely improve perceived kind of smoothness overall. This might be attributable to the game's unique design, which involves frequent asset streaming as you jump between different worlds, putting more stress on the PCIe interface during those transition moments. And this is also another one of those games in our test suite that uses direct storage, which may be part of the explanation for such a dramatic improvement in the averages at 1440p. Marvel Spider-Man 2, as we explored before in the 1080p analysis, uses direct storage, and we see this magnified difference once again albeit the scaling percentage is lower and mostly tops off past Gen 4. At 1440p, we see the average jump from 82 FPS on Gen 3 to 105 on Gen 5, and 101 sitting in the middle on Gen 4. This is, respectively, still a 28% improvement at 1440p, and is definitely still an incredible difference for, well, this particular title. The results for Cyberpunk are particularly interesting for 1440p. Without ray tracing, at 1440p we see 135 FPS in the lows on Gen 5, versus 112 FPS on Gen 3, which is about a 20% improvement. But the average frame rate only improved from 167 FPS to 177, which is just a 6% difference. Now we didn't cover this title for 1080p as the results are mostly CPU bound, as you can see from the results scaling off from 184 FPS to 194, which is a mere 5% improvement and only just above margin of error. The results with ray tracing are more of the same, except in the opposite direction. At Ultra, with ray tracing also set to Ultra, we are more or less GPU bound entirely across 1080p and 1440p, with the average at 1080p scaling from 121 FPS on Gen 3 to 127 FPS on Gen 5, and 82 to 86 FPS at 1440p between them both two. At 4K, we are pushing the pixels to the max, and this is where games tend to become almost entirely GPU bound. 
As expected, the PCIe scaling becomes much less pronounced at this resolution. However, in some situations, we do still get impressive scaling. But for Cyberpunk, that's just not the case with ray tracing enabled. Turning ray tracing off, however, is one of those titles where it has a noticeable impact. Here we see 95 FPS on Gen 5 versus 73 FPS on Gen 3 for the 1% lows, which is a massive 30% improvement, which is, well, actually surprising at 4K. The average frame rate follows a similar pattern, improving from 91 FPS to 117, which is a significant 29% gain. And this suggests that some next-gen titles with complex rendering pipelines might still benefit from PCIe bandwidth, even at higher resolutions. Cyberpunk, however, is an outlier, and most other games show minimal scaling at 4K, and we'll quickly run through some of the titles to show this. Hogwarts Legacy, with ultra settings and ray tracing also set to ultra, were entirely bound at roughly 61 FPS across all generations. F124 on high, with no ray tracing, maintains some scaling even at 4K, but it's basically negligible due to the high frame rate, with 117 FPS on Gen 5 versus, well, 111 FPS on Gen 3, so about a 5% improvement for the 1% lows, while the average, well, it barely budged. A Playtale Requiem at Ultra is totally GPU bound from 123 to 126 FPS between Gen 3 and Gen 5 for the averages, while the lows, again, barely changed. Then Black Myth Wukong showed no gain in average frame rate between Gen 3 and Gen 5, coming in between 80 to 82 FPS. Although, curiously, the 1% lows notably drop significantly here compared to PCIe Gen 4, down to 52 FPS from 72 and 73 at Gen 5. Now, when we look specifically at games with some forced hardware accelerated ray tracing versus standard rasterization, some interesting patterns emerge. Ray tracing generally increases the complexity of the rendering pipeline, which theoretically should put more stress on the PCIe interface. So let's take a look at two games that prominently feature ray tracing, Alan Wake 2 and Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. As we look at Alan Wake 2 on high, with ray tracing also set to high at 1080p, we see some interesting behavior. With PCIe Gen 5, we get 145 FPS average compared to 140 on Gen 3, which is just a 3.6% improvement in terms of the 1% lows. The average frame rate, however, shows a slightly more noticeable difference in terms of raw numbers, with 211 FPS on Gen 5 versus 204 FPS on Gen 3. Though again, this is still just a 3.4% gain. But what's fascinating though is that PCIe Gen 4 delivers 212 FPS, highlighting diminishing returns beyond this, but still shows a difference compared to PCIe 3. As we move to 1440p with Alan Wake 2, the scaling becomes a bit more pronounced, with 1% lows of 133 FPS on Gen 5 versus 125 FPS on Gen 3, which is a 6.4% improvement. The average frame rate also shows an increase from 162 to 164 FPS, which equates to just a 1.2% gain, so neither here nor there. Then at 4K resolution, the pattern shifts dramatically. In terms of the lows, Gen 5 delivers 85 FPS average versus 83 on Gen 3, so virtually no improvement, but Gen 4 drops to 81 FPS. And it's more of the same for the average frame rate, with 97 FPS on Gen 5 versus 98 FPS on Gen 3, and then 100 FPS on Gen 4. This inconsistent scaling suggests that, well, at 4K, we're entirely GPU bound, and the PCIe generation makes virtually no difference for Alan Wake 2, with ray tracing enabled at 4K. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle shows a more dramatic scaling pattern, and at 1080p with ultra settings, Gen 5 delivers 192 FPS average versus 137 FPS on Gen 3, which is a massive 40% improvement for the 1% lows. The average frame rate follows a similar trend with 223 FPS on Gen 5 versus 191 FPS on Gen 3, which is a smaller but still welcome 17% increase. This suggests that Indiana Jones is much more sensitive to PCIe bandwidth than Alan Wake 2 was, possibly due to differences in how the engine handles asset streaming or geometry processing. At 1440p, Indiana Jones continues to show significant scaling with 135 FPS on Gen 5 versus 107 FPS on Gen 3, which is a 26% improvement in terms of the 1% lows. The average frame rate scales from 166 to 191 FPS, which is a 15% gain, so things are at least consistent. Even at 4K, we see meaningful scaling with 106 FPS on PCIe 5.0 versus 95 FPS on PCIe 3.0. So an 11.6% improvement for the lows, while the average frame rate showed a similar pattern, albeit smaller, with 127 FPS versus 119, leading to a 6.7% increase. Now what these two games demonstrate is that the impact of ray tracing on PCIe bandwidth requirements varies dramatically depending on the specific game engine and implementation.
Or Alamite 2 becomes primarily GPU bound with ray tracing enabled, making PCIe generation less relevant, Indiana Jones continues to benefit from that extra bandwidth, even at higher resolutions. This challenges the conventional wisdom that ray tracing workloads universally benefit from increased PCIe bandwidth. Instead, it appears that the specific implementation and engine optimizations play a crucial role in well, determining whether the PCIe interface becomes a bottleneck. Some games become so GPU bound with ray tracing that PCIe bandwidth is no longer the limiting factor, while others continue to show substantial improvements with newer PCIe generations. Now, PCIe scaling in gaming follows some pretty clear patterns, but also shows some surprising results in specific titles. The impact is most noticeable at 1080p, diminishes at 1440p, and then becomes minimal for most games at 4K. And even then, sometimes the lows are affected more than the averages, or in other cases, vice versa. Racing simulators and games with complex CPU calculations tend to benefit the most from newer PCIe generations, while graphically intensive titles with ray tracing, well, that often becomes so GPU bound that PCIe bandwidth is just no longer the limiting factor. For most gamers, PCIe 4.0 represents the best balance of performance and cost in 2025. PCIe Gen 3 is becoming, I guess, a limiting factor in some titles, but it does remain adequate for budget builds, while PCIe Gen 5 offers incremental improvements that are hard to justify given the price premium of compatible hardware. Now, as game engines continue to evolve and leverage more complex rendering techniques, we may see PCIe bandwidth become more relevant in the future. But for now, it's just one factor among many that influence gaming performance. And well, it's just not the most critical one for most users. My honest opinion is that if you are looking to get a new PCIe 5.0 based GPU, whether that be a 5090 or something lower in the stack, if you're still running a PCIe 4.0 capable motherboard, you're not really leaving much performance on the table when you consider how most games performed here today. If, however, you're still on PCIe 3.0 hardware, then the idea of upgrading becomes much more advisable. Though in this case, I think it's a given that you're not buying an RTX 5090 and still rocking a PCIe 3.0 capable motherboard. You're more than likely looking, well, at using bleeding edge of tech in the first place. Though these results are scalable to a degree with other PCIe 5.0 GPUs. And we just used an RTX 5090 to eliminate other factors at play. So. What do you think about these results? Were you surprised by any of the PCIe scaling patterns that we saw? Let me know in the comments section below. Also, if you enjoyed this deep dive, then a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do and want more eTechnics content, then check out our Patreon, where you get early access to testing data, behind the scenes content, and exclusive meetups at the eTechnics offices. The link is, as always, down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.